Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting. Connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your cake wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Alex Anarco, a German Monero podcaster who speaks passionately about the true value of Monero. Doug and Alex talk about the Monero scene in Germany, the TIP XMR project that Alex is working on with partners, some Monerotopia debacle talk, and much more. Monero Talk starts now. Right. Alex, what's going on, man? Hi. Glad to be here. Yes. Yeah, so people were telling me I had to reach out to you. It was about time we uh, got together and talked at a show. So, yeah, I'm very excited as well. You have your own podcast. Yes. I, uh, for those people who don't know me, I host the German speaking Monero Mumble podcast, where we once a month talk about. The current developments in the Monero space, and yeah, I do this podcast with two other uh, guys, Grisha and Till, and Grisha is also uh, my co-developer with TipXMR. So this is the side project we started where we want to make it easy and possible for streamers to accept Monero donations just like they would with uh, Streamlabs and maybe Twitch Bits and fund their streams through Monero. Very cool, man. Yeah, your partner. I spoke to him a few times. We've we've talked on like those hangout sessions and stuff. Yeah, clubhouse and stuff. Clubhouse, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I wish I could listen to your podcast. Yeah, unfortunately, it's in German, so we automatically exclude like a very large percentage of the world. But one of the motivations behind starting Monero Mumble was actually okay. We need to also make this. Um, great content that's available in English, accessible to a German speaking audience. So that's why most of the time we're just breaking things down. And of course, we're also reading the uh, English subreddit and um, English news sites. So yeah, it's just a matter of bringing everybody into the boat because unfortunately, not everybody in Germany is as proficient in English as, as you would hope. Yeah, yeah, no, every everybody in you know the United States just thinks the whole world speaks English. So, you know, that's the way we are, and certainly, yeah, not, certainly not the case. But uh, the Monero scene in Germany is is pretty big, right? Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to estimate how big it actually is because personally, I've only met a few dozen people on like uh, meetups. There was a very active meetup in Berlin for a time in the room 77 um, uh, bar. But unfortunately, due to Corona and the government regulation, they had to close. And so I think this meetup is over and I'm not living in Berlin anymore, so I can't go anyway. But yeah, there's a lot of people hanging out on social media or at least in Telegram. And I think they're also um, a high caliber of community members because these are people who actively think about the technology and are building stuff. So for example, the um, Monero tip bot that recently retired on Telegram was developed by one of the guys in our Telegram group. And the idea for this bot also originated, originated in that Telegram group. Interesting. 
Yeah. So like how, how many people would you say were going to the meetups? It's like, you know, 10, 20 guys or something, or not necessarily guys, but 10, 20. Yeah. If, if it's like um, 20, it was a lot. Most of the time it was between five and 12 people, I would say. Okay. Yeah. And um, what's like the scene otherwise? I mean, because like we said, you know, so everything I I'm seeing is through the lens of an English speaker. I go on the Monero subreddit, uh, you know, tune into those that speak English about crypto. Is it being spoken about a lot in the German scene? Is it, uh, you know, being posted about a lot and in, in German language uh, forums? What's, I mean, give us any I, idea there. I mean, when people say, because I've heard people say like, oh, it's, you know, Monero is big in Germany or whatever. People talk about it. Can you get, give us any kind of indications of, about that other than the, you know, the meetups? I think, um, as I said, the technical, um, how to say, know-how is there. Mm -hmm. So people run their own full notes and are very quick to adopt and also innovate and um, try to build cool stuff with Monero and other open source technologies. And so, for example, there's also a lot of Bitcoin full notes in Germany. And if you are somewhat familiar with the German history, we are somewhat branded by uh, the Soviet Union with the DDR and their day they had the big surveillance state already where they would bug your apartment and you had some gay guy sitting in your basement that would uh, like write down everything you said and if you didn't agree with the party you would go to re-education and so there is a strong focus on privacy at least with the core uh, people i would say and also cash is used a lot in germany so i think the I mentality that. for a um, coin like monero is just naturally there yeah right so you're starting to see that enter the mainstream a little bit like you said everybody's using cash over there or they, they understand the value of, of of what makes cash important right they're not just using it for the sake of using it they're using it for its you know, censorship resistant uh, abilities, right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, you would hope, but also there is this big movement just driven by the social media of like just giving your privacy away and not really caring about it. So w with young people who have not lived through the DDR, hmm. um, they don't have that experience. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's unfortunate to see. So are people using it at, on the streets and restaurants at all? Can you go to like a cafe and, and spend Monero? Is, is no, it no, no, not by a long shot. You can't eat, like, that's the thing with Germany. The brain power is here, but the government regulation is awful. Like, if you want to have a company that is handling cryptocurrencies and you are in some capacity a custodian, you have to already get a BaFin license. BaFin is the... Um, institution here for financial regulation. They do a great job. I don't know if you've heard of the Wirecard scandal, but that's also um, due to their oversight. And they just strangle the crypto market um, mm. from an entrepreneurship perspective because it's almost impossible to do a startup here. And if you really do it, then you have a huge investment in legal um, in the legal department, which usually is a deal breaker for a startup. Right. So it's only the big guys. I mean, that's like here in New York, you had the bit license or you have the bit license. Although with our new mayor, he's talking, uh, you know, it's just some very bullish talk that's happening. He's, you know, wants New York to be the, the crypto capital of the world. Uh, first thing they have to do is get rid of, rid of that bit license, which um, really is kind of out of his purview. But um, my point is, uh, you could still, despite the bit, bit license and the, the fact that it obviously it makes it difficult to start crypto companies here, um, peer to peer can't be stopped and it's, it's legal, right? So anybody who's running a business, a cafe, a restaurant, whatever, they could, they could accept crypto. They could accept Monero. Uh, is that the case in Germany? That's the case, right? Yeah, it's, it is the case that you can get paid in Monero and you could get even paid in cows if you find the adequate exchange rate on the day of the exchange. So there the law is generally um, very liberal. However, 
there is this movement generally in the European Union and more broadly speaking internationally with the Financial Action Task Force um, that you have to implement like the, the ludicrous regulations that will basically make it impossible to use a, or yeah, I don't know how that's, this will work in implementation, but I think the worst case is that you could not use an open source wallet, that all wallets would have to be custodial wallets or at least um, have like a manufacturer that, it's li that is licensed by the European Union. So there is this very um, yeah, concerning movement. And Germany is like the, one of the first companies uh, or first, sorry, countries to implement this um, these guidances from the Financial Action Task Force. So I don't know, the regulation is very bad. And when I look at the current news of everyday Germany, I get very disheartened because I feel there is not much resistance to this movement of Big Brother. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so wait, have they actually gotten to that point in Germany where they're saying you can't I think they have, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on this, so don't quote me, but I think they have one of, they are one of the first countries to have like this legal draft, this proposition. And, you know, once they have this, it's usually another few months, maybe a year until something becomes law. So mm -hmm. obviously, and I'm sure you agree, uh, given, given your name and, you know, the, the, the fact that you're, uh, so knowledgeable about crypto, it's, you know, regulation is certainly a con concern. We don't want to see it slow down crypto, but the whole purpose of crypto, if built right, uh, is that you don't really care about the regulation, right? Yeah, I, I'm totally with you. And ideally speaking, the code itself is the regulation and you have just the the community or the network of people guiding themselves through a protocol. I think this is so essential. Uh, you know, I have kind of the word anarchy in my name and I'm not a Monotov co a cocktail throwing um, vandalist. I like rules. I just want these rules to be fair. So they should apply to everyone equally. I want universal human rights. And this is simply um, yeah, not possible with with the regulation in Germany. Yeah, there's such a misunderstanding of that word, right? Anarchy. Um, it it connotates chaos, or, or at least that's what people interpret it as chaos uh, and not realizing what the real mission is or belief behind those that that understand it and believe in it, right? What, what, what yeah. would you, how would you describe the uh, philosophical concept of being an anarchist? I would go back to the original Greek word, which Anarchy means without rulers, and this is, I would 100% uh, agree. As I said, without rulers, this does not mean without rules. I'm a big fan of rules. They just have to be fair, apply to everyone equally. And when you have a ruler, somebody who is in charge of the rules, making them, interpreting them, and executing them, they are outside of the system, and then there are no rules. Then you are just in principle, a victim to some arbitrary tyrant and whatever the tyrant decides, that's the rule of the day. You know, today it is illegal to, I don't know, sit in a wheelchair. Tomorrow it is illegal to walk without a mask. It's just arbitrary whim. And what I think is much better is when you have a protocol where the rules are very simple, they are set, they don't change a lot. People can plan with these rules and interact based on them and this works perfectly when you look at technology for example the http protocol is a protocol for the internet to work yes and so is bitcoin a protocol for people to um yeah transfer value digitally and just the same monero is also a protocol and i think really we are living now in the time where these um, anarchic ideas and these ideas of the Austrian school of economics can really be implemented just because we have the technology and the capability and infrastructure also to implement them and use them in the everyday life. 
Right. They've always been theoretical, but there's been no means of, of achieving them. And now uh, it appears we have the ability to do that with the invention of, of Bitcoin. You, yeah, you speak, but, speak uh, very well, man. Right? You speak English very well. You should consider doing some uh, English episodes. You, you, you know, you could uh, get the word. I listen to a lot of podcasts and I can say that the Monero Talk podcast is one of my favorite podcasts. Whenever you release an episode, I downloaded it immediately and listen usually to it within a, uh, one day. So okay. yeah, I have a lot of exposure to the English speaking community, at least. Thank you, man. So... How close do you think we get to that ideal or do we even continue to trend towards it? Does something happen? This ideal of, uh, you know, people ruling themselves as opposed to being ruled by somebody, you know, fo following there being rules, but not a, not a ruler. Do you think we get close to that, that ideal and that we're trending towards it? Um, yes and no. I think the, uh, the scissor is expanding, so to say. In Germany, we have this uh, saying, die Schere geht auseinander, meaning the scissor is opening. So the two ends are going in the extremes. And so I think on the one hand, we have this very concerning uh, developments in the technology space with Facebook and Google and governments trying to surveil us and censor us and um, basically, yeah, Totally. Force us to, to live uh, to their ways. And on the other hand, we have these really exciting um, developments in the crypto space. For example, there's just one. I think the technology space in general is, is where the innovation is coming from. And there we see a lot of tools that actually just give people the power to, for example, send a million um, Monero or a million euro worth of Monero to South Africa or whatever country in basically the blink of an eye for, for almost nothing. And so I think in the end, it comes down to the individual actually claiming their sovereignty. And this means that you will say, okay, I am responsible for myself and I want to exercise that power over myself. So I have to be knowledgeable in the world to use the tools that I can use to my advantage and i think yeah it is, this is a decision of everybody and i have made this decision for myself after i fell down the monero rabbit hole only use free and open source uh, software and this is cumbersome in some ways but it's also rewarding because you gain sovereignty which these custodial services will never give give you so yeah, I realized as I was asking you that question, I'm such an optimist that I was just talking about the, the crypto side of it and not not the other side that most people are thinking about, which is, you know, the the surveillance capitalism, these these uh, you know, the the tyranny that we're seeing kind of reach its peak around the world, hopefully its peak. Um, but do you think cryptocurrency I guess wins at the end? Do you think overall overall it's it's going to beat, uh, you know, what we're seeing in the traditional system. I think I'm a romantic idealist, so I hope that it wins. But I also think I'm a realist uh, also. So I think history is not determined. And so it's the future is uncertain. And all we can do is in the here and now do the best to bring about a future that we would want to see. And I think Monero is a great effort in that regard because it is touching on such a fundamental aspect of human life, which is money. What do you see as being the biggest threat or obstacle to achieving achieving the goal? I think I think there could be a state crackdown if the if the states of the world, the governments, I don't know, the G20 or whatever, really decide, okay, we want to. Um, nip this in the bud and uh, stop terrorism financing and all these uh, bad words that get uh, pushed to the front. Um, and they could say, uh, we will punish you by death or prison, uh, lifetime in prison if you use Monero. And I think this is not even so unreasonable. If you look at the drug war in the United States, what the government has done to its people there they have no problem. Yeah, once you've indoctrinized the people enough that they say, "Oh, well, it has probably a reason that these uh, this, that these guys are in jail." Then, yeah, 
all it takes for good uh, for bad to win is for good people to do nothing right so um, yeah. exactly exactly that's what i always say like the you know the advice i always give is if you want to see monero succeed uh just start using it and adopt it and the only thing that can stop it is people thinking it, it effectively can be stopped yeah and this is so true you know when i first came to monero i was just getting into the bitcoin space and learning about monero has really motivated me and really like um awoken my curiosity and i've just been learning about monero technology protocols networks um all that kind of stuff and now i i have a job in the industry so it's really funny i learned or i taught myself to code because i said okay i don't know really what i want to do with my life but this is at least something i can get behind and hey look if it doesn't work out um, coding for Monero, maybe you can even find a job at another place because developers are in demand. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's just great. And it's all about learning and um, trying to implement that knowledge that you learned in the real world and, and make a change. And it's very easy with Monero. You know, it's an open source uh, project. So... Right. Anybody can start working on it. I always you describe it as like the the dream startup where, you know, you don't have to get hired. You just have to start working. Um, and yeah. you can, you know, own essentially own a piece of stock in the company by buying and holding Monero. What, um, what do you think of, uh, did you see they, they recently blacklisted some Monero wallets? Have you, have you seen that news? No, I have, I have not seen this. Yeah, which is kind of crazy because it How does that work exactly? Right. So the, the idea is, if anything, I guess it, it could, uh, you know, exchanges uh, mm -hmm. will have to filter out so they wouldn't be allow any transactions take place where they would send Monero off an exchange to one of these blacklisted wallets. Um, but other yeah. than that, it doesn't really do much. But it's interesting to, to see the government try to do that. Yeah, and I think they even tried the same with Bitcoin, you know, blacklist, bit, uh, blacklist Bitcoin addresses. And mm -hmm. there it makes at least a little bit more sense because you can see in the blockchain if transaction came to this address. But even there, you know, just uh, right. create a new address and you're golden. And with Monero, it's even more pointless because, okay, now I'm withdrawing to my own non-blacklisted uh, wallet address and then I'm just sending it on. Well... Right, like I, I could theor theoretically go send Monero to this blacklisted address right now, and nobody would know, right? Uh, not recommending yeah. anybody do that because whatever. But uh, I, I, you know, theoretically can do it very easily, as opposed to uh, a Min Bitcoin blacklisted address where it would be seen right away that the the transaction took place. Yeah, but I think this is the the move that I um, touched on earlier that we have more KYC and we will, I think the best case scenario for the governments is we will end up in a world where all wallets are somewhat surveillable. So you know that you send a transaction and the wallet provider actually, actually gets the notification and gets this automatic check with the risk profile of the output just uh, sent or the risk profile of the transaction. I think this is the world they want to steer in and for this world to exist, you kind of have to outlaw the open source wallets, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm more of an optimist in that regard. Well, I, I'm sure you agree that they wouldn't be able to effectively stop it. And I also don't think they would try, at least here in the United States, um, it's, you know, the Constitution does exist at the end of the day. Uh, so I, I don't see how they start to do that. Um, it's just a piece of paper, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I think, um, yeah, people, I don't know. I, I agree with like you. Effectively, you cannot stop it, but you can create this division. You know, like I said, the scissor is is opening. Where on the one hand you have this completely transparent and everything is KYC world, and on the other hand you have this black market where. Uh, people are using Monero and nobody know what, knows what's going on. And then you have this split in the society where the one side demonizes the other. And 
yeah, I think this is not a sustainable long-term relationship of society. Mm. So what what drove you to Monero in the first place? You said you started off as a Bitcoiner. Was it just the, the typical story that you saw Bitcoin lacking privacy? No, you know, I came to Bitcoin as a youngster and was full of zeal. So I went to a lot of meetups in Germany and I went to one Bitcoin meetup in Karlsruhe and they have a good university there. So I think there were some students from the university and one of the students, I said, okay, and this was in the beginning of uh, 2017. And I said, okay, what coins should I buy? Because this bull market was already kind of ramping up and I was getting greedy. And he said, he had this very based attitude. He said, you know, don't invest in, in shit coins. Don't go chasing the pump. What I like is Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the first. Bitcoin did it best. And what's also interesting is Litecoin and Monero. And I said, oh, Monero, what's this? And then he said, oh, yeah, they are doing these ring signatures, which are interesting from a technological perspective. And this really kind of uh, opened the door for me. And along my way, I found a lot of things in Monero that are at least interesting from a technological perspective. And so I always cringe very hard when I hear Bitcoiners, um, you know, um, saying all altcoins are shit coins because it is such an un, a nuanced statement to say a coin like Monero is the same as a coin like Dogecoin, you know, where the brain power that goes into it and the sweat is, it's not even a co comparison. So yeah, I, I fell down the Monero rabbit hole and economically it makes sense to me that you need fungibility. I understand that Bitcoin doesn't really have fungibility or not enough so much so that it becomes a problem sometimes. And um, that's why I have high hopes for Monero. Yeah. Uh, 2017, you sound like, uh, you know, if it wasn't in Germany, it was here, I, I would be that guy telling you. And um, <laughs> I was telling a lot of people then. And, but, you know, since giving, uh, giving out that advice, I don't know if it, it was the best advice in terms of your, your dollar value, right? Because we've seen a lot of other projects. Um, I think ones that we can call shit coins, right? That we have no problem calling a shit coin. Uh, go up dramatically in value while Monero has just kind of, you know, stagnated. It, it hasn't, it's not, obviously not going, it's going up with the market, but it's doesn't appear to be going up as much as it should be given its actual, you know, value, what it, what it, what it is actually capable of doing. What are your thoughts there? Uh, you know, I have no regrets. Um, I may hold some Monero, not sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but to me, this does not matter for me. It's really about the long term, and we have not, or, or I have not seen the long term yet. You know, 2017 is only like five years ago. So long term is like 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 50 years. And that's what I'm interested in. And I heard this really wise quote once that is, that said, uh, short term is sentiment, long term is fundamentals. And I wholeheartedly agree, uh, agree with it because I think the price of an asset follows from its value and value is subjective according to Ludwig von Mises and the Austrian uh, economists. And I believe this as well. So what makes people value a thing? Well, I believe it's the utility they actually gain from it. and when I look at Monero, I find very a lot of a lot of utility in it. You know, I can send you right now money as much as I want for a very small cost to myself. Uh, you have it. We have financial finality. You know, I cannot reverse that transaction and charge it back to my account. So we have certainty this transaction is done. You have the money, and and this is great utility. And if a lot of people have not recognized this, well, sucks for them. I believe my entrepreneurial uh, knowledge is correct and Monero does have a lot of utility and I think time will prove it and there will be some reality checks for other projects who 
um, do not have this utility where people will use a lot of uh, lose a lot of money or I don't know uh, get raided by the feds or whatever. Do you think Bitcoin has utility? I mean, I, the utility that uh, is is often cited there is digital gold. Do you think Bitcoin has utility as digital gold? Um, you know, Bitcoin has had utility for me. I was uh, paid at, in Bitcoin at some point in my career. And this was great because the company who employed me was not based in the country where I worked. I was not li even living in the, so I was not in Germany. And how do you do a, the bank transfer then? And when, uh, Bitcoin was just the easiest thing. You know, they said, okay, either you give us your first name, your last name, your um, bank information, the address of your bank, or you give us a Bitcoin address. And I was like, this is a no brainer. I'm just generating a new Bitcoin address. I also requested Monero, but um, they didn't, they couldn't handle Monero. So uh, that was too bad. But at that point in time, when, uh, Bitcoin had a great utility for me. Right now, it still has some utility because it is going up in value, but, um, I think as a money, and by money, I mean as a medium of exchange, it is not re really usable for me right now because it has, you know, the slow transaction times <laughs> and high, high transaction costs compared to Monero. And I have to worry about financial privacy, which I don't want to worry about. So it depends on in what context you ask me. Uh, when it comes to a store of value, yes, Bitcoin has some. When it comes to medium of exchange, I don't exchange in Bitcoin. Do you think Monero can start to take on the use case of store of value as well? I mean, obviously it already has, right? Depending on when, when, you, when you bought it. Uh, maybe not doing as well as Bitcoin in that regard because number hasn't gone up as much. But does Monero start to move from being purely uh, a means of exchange to also being a store of value? Uh, yes, I believe so. I believe the function uh, of store of value follows ultimately from the function of medium of exchange. And I would say this is because if I can exchange my com money commodity today for something, and I could exchange it yesterday for something, I can very likely exchange it tomorrow for something. So I believe Monero is just building its track record right now and gaining a reputation. You know, it's very stable. This is, could be a good thing for some people. If you're running a business on Monero, this is at least not dragging you down too much. So um, in that regard, it's not bad. Also, I think Monero doesn't have all the marketing and all the hype behind it that the other crypto projects have behind it. If you look at the top 10 in terms of market cap capitalization, you know, my jaw, jaw, uh, jaw drops to the floor because there's Dogecoin in there. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, I think the, the, the value of Monero is mo a more accurate reflection or I'm sorry, I should say the price of Monero is a more accurate reflection of the actual economy going on because I believe there is an economy going on in Monero. You know, it's hard to tell with certainty, but there are black uh, darknet markets who are Monero only or also accept Monero. You had this um, great Dutch uh, doctor on, which I thought was just an excellent episode because these are the real world economics where the rubber hits the road and people have to decide, okay, do I want to use uh, this asset or this asset as a money commodity? And as um, your guest in that episode pointed out, for the vendors, actually, it has great utility to use Monero because they're uh, reducing so much operational security risk. And so, yeah, I think... The utility is there, and just because the hype is not there, the price is low. But I think Monero could easily be 10x what it is right now, very easily. You know, every 
threshold that Bitcoin clears, I think to myself, this is also possible for Monero. There's no reason in my mind why Monero cannot do what Bitcoin did. I don't think the network effect is so strong. You know, there's uh, plenty of examples to show that the network effect has failed and the first mover is not actually the one who is still holding the reins. And uh, yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, I don't know if you saw Monero broke a new all-time high in terms of yeah. transaction count, I believe, today. Yes, I saw that. And I'm kind of getting a little bit um, a weird feeling in my tummy because the spike in transaction is very steep. It's a very sharp incline. And with Monero, there is this possibility of flooding the um, blockchain with transaction in order to eliminate decoys. So yes, it could be a good indication that the number of transactions on average, every day are going up, but it could also be an indication of an attack. So I don't know. Never know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, all good in the end, right? Uh, the more people that use Monero, even if they're trying to attack it, I think ultimately works out as long as we continue to evolve uh, and update where these type of attacks uh, essentially won't be able to achieve anything is the way I look at it. Yeah. Uh, I agree. We have to raise the ring size. This is the weakest link in the chain for Monero. And if we improve this, um, this ring size, increase it, we make it uh, very hard for these attackers to do the kinds of attacks they're doing right now. And um, yeah, so I'm very hopeful. I was very hopeful for Triptych. And now that Triptych is not uh, going to happen, I think. Um, I'm hopeful for Seraphis or whatever, the Lente Spark, whatever gets implemented. I'm just, and this is uh, also a good question. Um, I think one of your last guests also talked about um, uh, Seraphis and he said, and the same is true with the Lente Spark, that you have to change the address format when you do this upgrade. And we have to think about this for a moment. You know, if you change the address format, you're breaking, you're doing a hard, hard fork. You know, there's, you have to update all your spots where your address is linked. So your open alias, your website, um, whatever you're using. And I think this could be a, yeah, a huge impact on the Monero community. What do you think? Are we right now too large to do this kind of hard fork? Uh. You know, I, I obviously was thinking along those lines that you're talking about, but I guess the, the counter argument is, well, you're going to get all these benefits, but also it's just good to, to clean house, right? Because you're forcing people to, to post now new addresses and, and having stagnant addresses out there uh, is probably just never good. Even if, you know, we have stealth addresses, it's probably just not a good practice to keep a Monero address out there in perpetuity as something that will, you know, people can always uh, interact with and donate to. So I, you know, I see it kind of both ways. And I do think the the benefits outweigh the negatives there. I mean, we we have a very real use case for that, right? We have gratuitous where we have the coffee thing. Uh, so that's going to cause a little bit of a headache with us. Um, we're going to have to figure that out. Uh, but I think ultimately it's okay. I do hear what you're saying. Uh, do, can you think of any examples where it's going to cause a real big issue? You know, I onboard a lot of people. <laughs> Everybody I meet, I'm talking about Monero. And usually if I owe them some money in some capacity, I encourage them strongly to get a Monero wallet. I have even printouts of little paper wallets that I give them where they can write their seed phrase. And when I think of those, you know, for me, there's no problem. So Rafis, please give me, I'm downloading the update like the minute it comes out. But for these people who only have this vague connection to Monero, I see this potential where they yeah, could get turned off because they say, what? I created this wallet last year and now I have to change my address. I have to tell everybody my new address. Uh, uh, this is not good user experience, that kind of thing. And... Yeah, well, the scenario is they would have to yeah tell somebody a new a new re receive address, right? To send to, 
Uh, but it's not like their their wallet is going to change, right? It's just like if, especially if they're using, you know, something like a Cake Wallet or the, you know, it will, the update is just going to happen automatically. Uh, they're not going to really notice it, and then when they go to generate, send somebody an address, hey, send me some Monero, it's just going to generate the the new the new address, right? Um, but yeah, if they had sent somebody an old address saying, you know, send Monero here. Uh, yeah, they're gonna have to go back and and resend a new address to those people. It's kind of like almost like changing an email, right? Yeah, and changing an email is painful. I don't know if you have ever done it, but yeah, right. yeah you always have like at least some. You always have to keep access to the email account right. because there could be something important coming in. But they just you know, won't be able to send it, right? So if they have, I mean, I I might be misspeaking here, and I don't I don't want to uh, talk out of line. But my understanding is. Well, they just wouldn't be able to send. Somebody wants to send Monero to an old address pre Uh, They just wouldn't have a way of even right. Just gonna, it's not gonna compute right when you put in this old address format. It's just not gonna let you even try to send. Yeah, the wallet has to validate the address. You know what's the updated address? But it's not gonna. It's it's a little. It's a little dirty. Yeah, it's not. It's not a perfect. uh, And this is interesting to me because. The way I use Monero, you know, I have onboarded have the office where I work. And so when we order for lunch, while the other people are using PayPal to even the sheets, I'm sending Monero to the to the people. And the way I do this is I have an address book in my cake wallet where the addresses are saved. Mm -hmm. And so that was my thinking, you know, usually I add somebody and I have their Monero address that they created explicitly for me. And then I save it in my address book. And if you do this consistently with like always issuing a new address, you will have a lot of work to do after the hard work. That's all I'm saying. And I'm saying no, it's, some people I, are not willing to undertake that effort and could get turned on, uh, tur- turned off, I said. Yeah, I totally hear you. But I, I do think we're early enough where it's uh, you know not going to be a big enough issue where we can't do it because... The positives are just are just so large, you know. Um, obviously, larger ring sizes and stuff will be able to add, and then um, you know, just just multi sig, right? Uh, it's just going to be easier to do a lot of things with with Seraphis. So, I ultimately my you know, obviously, I don't under this, even understand this stuff deep enough to really make that judgment call where you know, weighing the pros and cons. But from my superficial understanding. Uh, it seems like it's definitely worth worth it, and it's something we have to do. Otherwise, we have to sit here and wait for some new tech that's going to be invented that allows us to essentially upgrade without disrupting the addresses. And in talking with Co, that just doesn't seem like it's it's going to be possible. Yeah, I, I agree, and I had this debate with myself as well, where I was thinking. Oh no! You cannot change the address format. This will break backwards comp- uh, compatibility. And then the the other voice in my head was saying, "Oh no! You sound like one of these Bitcoiners. You always have to uh, maintain backwards compatibility." And I think if we want to do it, we have to do it ASAP. I see on the horizon a time where it will not be so easy for the Monero um, community to do the kind of update schedule they, that they have been doing. And I also see the potential danger of a community war in Monero, just as we have seen with Bitcoin, you know, around this question, for example, with the address format. I could easily see people go, um, like standing on the bandwagon saying, no, we cannot have uh, changed the address format. We have had it, uh, I don't know, for, since forever. I, I think sub addresses were... Uh, added later on but i think the primary address with the four at the beginning has been there since the beginning so yeah yeah but in the uh, end i agree with you privacy uh, triumphs and we have to bite the bullet and just use the better technology yeah 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 you know and just to be clear for anybody's listening that might be freaking out i mean you know if you if you have your if you have your monero and you have you know you have your keys you know none of that's going to change right it's not like this update happens and then the Monero in your wallet uh, is no longer accessible. You know, if you have your private keys and they're written on a piece of paper, they could stay on that in perpetuity and it's going to be fine. You'll still be able to access your paper wallet or something. Because for me, obviously that would be 
you know, I don't even know how you would possibly do that. That that would be. I was uh, going to ask. That, would that, that be too far for you? Changing the oh yeah the mon yeah, mnemonic yeah. seed phrase. Yes. Okay. Definitely. definitely. Um, I don't see how you can possibly do that. I mean, because people may have their Monero locked away somewhere. I think you know you're you're definitely crossing a line there. Um, but updating on the other end, I don't know. It's it's kind of comparable to other things too, right? Like your credit card stops working at some point and you got to get a new credit card. You know, uh, they update the terminals that accept credit cards, you know, and the old tech doesn't work anymore. Now you need a credit card with a chip in it, you know? So it's not like, uh, people aren't accustomed to having to update tech for interacting in a monetary system, you know? Yeah. Well, it's another, no. another positive spin on it. Right. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, do you think, Monero needs to or should be okay with talking about number go up and Monero uh, taking on the use case of digital gold, right? It's always kind of not, you know, some people talk about it. I like to talk about it. I think Monero certainly, if Bitcoin can be digital gold, Monero could be better digital gold. Uh, but you don't see, you know, you see some of the community that like to avoid that conversation, like to talk more about it as just being a transactional tool. But do you think? We should start talking more about that, or maybe we shouldn't. What, what's your What's your take on that? I like to talk about technology. I'm in it for the technology, and what really excites me is uh, talking about, I don't know, the Monero Python uh, library that that was written, or Monero JavaScript, and stuff that you can do with the APIs, and cool stuff that you can do with the browser WebAssembly wallet, and while I find it very um, insightful to listen to talks about digital cash or store of value. To me, my mind is already made up on this. And um, yeah, as I said, you know, Monero is a good money because it's fungible and Bitcoin is not fungible. So to the extent it is not fungible, it is not good money. In most other regards, Bitcoin and Monero are very similar. You know, they are digital in their manifestation, so you can send them around the world, uh, no problem. They are super divisible. They are super durable because they have no physical body. Um, yeah, they, they are very transportable uh, because they are digital. And uh, hold on, I actually wrote this down. What, what I... What did I miss as the good characteristic of money? And yeah, it's very verifiable and scarce. So the verif uh, verif verification is done by the wallet automatically. Either you receive the Monero or you don't. And scarcity, this is the most interesting argu argument to me between Bitcoin and Monero because the emission schedule is different. With Monero, you have a soft cap instead of a hard cap, meaning that the inflation rate will only asymptotically approach zero whereas bitcoin with bitcoin it will hit a hard zero but this is a yeah a small difference that maybe is relevant for the security model where you want to incentivize miners to to keep securing the network but in terms of economics i think it's very similar but with the fungibility in the current context of the world with the surveillance states and so on, I think there is a big difference. And yeah, I think in, in terms of long-term uh, economics with store of value and so on, Monero is just as good as Bitcoin. Yeah, right on, man. And yeah, in terms of the, terms of the scarcity, uh, I think people have heard me talk about this quite some, quite a bit. Uh, you know, obviously, Bitcoin's comes with a sacrifice, right? So it sounds great. Twenty-one million cap, it's a great meme. Yeah. Um, but you gotta you gotta realize at what cost that's coming at. I think you touched upon it a little bit, which is basically the the security, right? So there's an unknown there with Bitcoin with regards to how the network will be secured once that cap is reached or it's it's nearly reached what will incentivize the miners to mine and theoretically it's transactions but that's theoretical and with transactions moving to the second layer uh, maybe that incentive won't be so strong and then so you're sacrificing the security of uh, the future security of the network which i think should play into the current security right because if you're buying something 
uh, for the purposes of storing value, you want to know that the network is not going to just be secure today, but in perpetuity. And I think Monero makes the sacrifice and saying, all right, well, we're more interested in sec securing the network, guaranteeing the security of the network versus a nice meme that says, you know, there'll only ever be 21 mil is the way I yeah. look at it. And I, I would say that's not even a sacrifice, you know, Satoshi right. Nakamoto is not God. And just because he determined the emission curve of Bitcoin the way he did does not mean this is perfect. And if you actually think about it, you know, with this question of the security in the long run in mind, it does not make a lot of sense that you would switch from, okay, we have a Coinbase reward to, okay, we are now fee only. Uh, so... Um, I think Monero has built on the, the learnings from Bitcoin there. Yeah, it seems like a pretty big risk for a coin that claims to be uh, so concerned about eliminating all risk for the purposes of storing value. Uh, almost as though they got a little too caught up in the number go up. But you're seeing, you know, I'm sure you've seen Peter Todd talk about this idea, mm -hmm. maybe having to add a tail emission. And, and <laughs> what's good luck with that. <laughs> Right, and this this adds to the, um, you know, question mark in in Bitcoin land too, right? Because if people are even just talking about it, then there becomes a concern that the emission schedule may be adjusted one day. Uh, in Monero, I don't think anybody thinks there's any concern that the emission schedule is going to be adjusted because we already made the hard decision of having this tail emission, so. If anything, maybe it would get eliminated if it, it was discovered that you don't need it. Uh, but obviously, it ties into dynamic, dynamic block size. But my point being, uh, in Bitcoin, there's still a question mark as to whether or not you may have to add. Uh, and in Monero, it's the hard work, the hard decisions already been made. Yeah, as you should make them in the beginning when you design the protocol, <laughs> since it's such an important fundamental. Uh, changing this along the way in Bitcoin, this will, I would almost bet my life, I will not do it, but I'm very certain that this will net, not happen just because the meme of the 21 million is so strong in Bitcoin. So I think they would rather die um, than change that, uh, that number. Um, so, yeah. 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 No, I agree. Or there'd be some major fork and yeah, just wouldn't, you'd always have those that stick on Bitcoin, even if it doesn't work anymore, even if you can only send, you know, one transaction, uh, you know, for whatever, a hundred thousand yes. dollars. Um, maybe we should, we should talk about your project a little bit more, right? Tip XMR. Is that what it's, it's that's what it's called? Yes. It's called Tip XMR. Yes. And so what, if you want to explain it again from the top and uh, let us know where you're currently at and I guess, what the vision is, what what's going on with it? Yeah, so uh, Tip XMR, uh, let me tell the story. Last year, I was uh, programming for one year and kind of getting the hang of it. And I was always learning with projects that I did by myself. And I was also doing the Monero Mumble and uh, some other YouTube streaming. And my YouTube channel was under a thousand subscribers. So... In YouTube, you can only accept live donations in your streams when you're above 1,000 subscribers. And I think you also need to have like 400 watched hours of video. And I thought, well, this sucks. This is a barrier to entry for me. And uh, I kind of, it would be nice for me to monetize the content that I'm doing voluntarily, just so to give the people the chance to support me and um, have this nice interaction with me as well. And since I was also watching a lot of Twitch, you know, most Twitch streamers have these um, notifications that pop up whenever somebody donates Twitch bits to the streamer, and then they have the opportunity of writing a message, maybe sending a GIF, and um, the message will be displayed in the stream, and the streamer will usually react to it, and that's cool. People make a living that way. That's That's super cool. What's not so cool is that you know, you have these barriers to entry and also Twitch and YouTube are known to censor their content creators. So if you are playing music that is copyrighted or saying stuff they don't uh, want you to say, then they will shut down your channel and from one day to the other end your existence and uh, your way of making a living. And 
so I'm an anarchist at heart and I'm also a cypherpunk at heart and cypherpunks write code. So the idea came, hey, why don't we do this with Monero? And so I pitched this idea to Grisha, who was also um, immediately um, caught with it. And then we started looking and we discovered that there is this JavaScript library called Monero JavaScript that has a WASM wallet for the browser. So what does it mean? WASM stands for WebAssembly, which basically is a technology that allows your browser, so Brave, Chrome, Safari, whatever you're using, to execute code uh, and basically run an application in the browser. And what the Monero WebAssembly wallet therefore is, it's a full-fledged browser wallet that is owned only by your local machine. So there is no interaction with the server. And this is important because as I mentioned earlier, in Germany, when you are doing something where you are acting as a custodian, so um, say you are holding the coins of the streamers and only sending the streamer the coins once the streamer withdraws from your server, well, then you need a BaFin license and you will never get a BaFin license. So we thought, oh my God, how cool is this? So we can build the service this way that the streamer is actually hosting their own wallet and only connecting to our server to, you know, send the messages that we will display in a transparent browser window that the streamer then in turn has implemented in their OBS. And this is a very standard setup that most streamers are familiar with because Streamlabs does it the same way with the transparent browser resource. And so what TipXMR is, it's actually a platform where streamers can easily register. They create a wallet in their browser and with that wallet, they log into our um, service. We do not store the wallet. We only have a hashed version of the uh, of the seed phrase, which we also use as a password to authenticate the user on login. So basically all you have to do to authenticate yourself is paste your seed phrase and um, then you can log in. You don't need, uh, and you don't need to explicitly um, tell a username, but you have a username, you will have a dashboard where you can kind of customize the settings of your stream. You know, there's really cool idea that you can do where the streamer could, for example, say, okay, uh, every second of showtime for a message in my stream costs, I don't know, five cents. And so the donator actually has to pay for the showtime. And, you know, a popular streamer can say, well, in my stream, not everybody can, can donate. Or if you want to donate, you have to pay a high price. And then PewDiePie will have a, a very large price, I don't know, $1 per second. And some other minor streamer will have no uh, second price at all. And little things like this that you can do are, are made possible by the um, WebAssembly browser wallet from the Monero JavaScript library. So from the, the standpoint of somebody who's consuming the content and tipping, do they need this browser widget as well? Or So to be clear, it's not a browser widget. It's a website that will eventually run under tipxmr.live. And there the streamer can sign in to the platform and uh, open their dashboard and sync their wallet. They can view transactions and the messages that the donators have written and maybe have some nice statistics. They can also customize how the animation would look. And um, of course I'm spitballing ideas here. We're not at that phase yet where we are branching out and making the, the dreams come true. But uh, yeah, in general, it will, be, it will be that. And for the viewer, they can also go to tipxmr.live and they will have um, categories just like you have on Twitch TV where you can say, okay, I want something with gaming. And then if the streamer um, in his dashboard has set his streaming category to gaming, he will appear there when he's live. And then you can go to the streamer and in the browser window, you type the message then uh, you can say, okay, I want 10 seconds of showtime and you will get a displayed a QR code and a sub address with a minimum amount you have to pay. And then this will be um, yeah, checked by the WebAssembly wallet of the streamer. 
that is running in his bra or her browser. And um, once the donation is seen by the wallet, the donation can be displayed in the stream. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I thought it was um, built into the browser or something like, a, you know, browser widget type thing. But because that, that would be interesting too, right? Is there... Yeah, but what we are not doing, we are not hosting the streams ourselves. So you would still host your stream with YouTube or with Twitch and people could donate to you over tipxmr.live. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, then, to the, the, the you, you, right. Yeah. So okay. basically what we're doing, we are non-custodial, which is very important. And we are also open source, which means once we're done, you know, the code is on GitHub, so you can host your own platform. If you want to make us competition, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. go ahead. You know, I gladly embrace it because my greater goal is to eliminate the censorship. You know, it's not about making money for me. This is a nice side benefit if I, um, <laughs> if I make a profit in the end, but this is not my motivation. You know, I want to see, I want to make it possible for people to gain their sovereignty back. And I think... TipXMR is one tool in that belt. Very cool, man. Very cool. Yeah, um, you mentioned tip the tip bots, right? Those are cool too. Yeah. I'd like to see. I was thinking about this and talking to other people about it. Uh, you know, a way to easily send Monero tips to, for example, Twitter addresses, right? Um, where the person receiving it, you know, maybe doesn't even no, you know, not even signed up to this system yet, but you could essentially send a tip to any at Monero at Twitter address, you know, so I could send a tip to, you know, whatever at, at Monero talk, um, in Monero. And then that person would get a message saying a tip. I mean, that's basically what a tip bot was, right. But you're not really seeing that much with, does one exist now for Twitter that like, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Like why? When I think about, I assume, I assume I, you've been following this stuff pretty closely, so uh, I don't know of any. And when I think about it, you know, if you want to provide a service like this, you have to make it custodian because the person who is sent the Monero to you have to hold it for them, right? So if you do it this way, architecturally, you are in big trouble when you are in, in Europe. So this may be right, one of right, the reasons right. why well, we haven't seen it yet. Yes. I was talking to Cake Wild about it. You know, I, I, I throw crazy ideas by them all the time, but you know, they have their hands full. They're working on a lot of stuff. Uh, but I thought that'd be cool. Remember, right. If I could open up my cake wallet and instead of putting an address in or, you, um, you know, I literally, the address would be at Monero talk or at whatever the Twitter address is. And the, the wallet would read it as that. Uh, and I could s effectively send a tip to any person on Twitter that has a Twitter address. And then they would get, you know, an at, and automatically there'd be an at message tweet to them saying like, Hey, go retrieve your tweet. You go, go retrieve your tip if they haven't yet already signed up to the system. But yeah, that would require somebody like cake to to be the the middleman there with it which you know i think is okay because they kind of already uh they could do that for that that service but i see what you're saying uh if you're trying to avoid that then that's not possible but you know i i, I think we're still going to uh see companies that are able to offer these services as custodians for for you know for quite some time if not forever um but yeah ideally we'll build these things in in ways where even tipping can't be stopped so i i do i do like the direction you're taking that's amazing and i think this is a recent development that um the technology has come so far that you can do most things non-custodially if we think about you can do now atomic swaps between monero and bitcoin this is a non-custodial swap so and we have the Monero uh, Wasm wallet, you know, the full-fledged wallet in your browser. This is also non-custodian. And usually it's harder to make these things in a non-centralized way because the easy way with uh, everything coding, well, yeah, I have a centralized server who, who has all the logic and who has all the data points and who makes the decision. But it's hard to do this in a decentralized way. It takes longer. 
But we are now in this era where the, um, the concepts are there and the implementations are there and people need to start taking these existing implementations and building upon it. And I think this is where things get really excited because what we've seen now with the atomic swaps, for example, this is just the proof of concept. The, the way I want to see it implemented is like, you can easily uh, do an atomic swap. You know, it's a no brainer. It has easy, um, a, a, an easy user experience. And to me, this seems a big hurdle right now in the crypto space that you have not an easy user experience and most people just don't want to bother and, um, yeah, so you have to make it easier. And for this, you need UX designers, you need um, people building applications like we are, you know, we are not writing on the Monero C++ code base. We are just connecting to the API and using stuff, using the library that Wootzer already wrote. So we're not reinventing the wheel. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, but we're standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, we're standing and we're making ourselves a little bit taller and, um, so I really want to do this call to action to your audience. Maybe there is some youngster in there who doesn't really know what to do with uh, his or her life. And I would say maybe look into programming because there's super cool stuff you can do. And for me personally, there's nothing more rewarding than sitting in front of my computer, you know, listening to Crypto Bear and Monero extremists. And I don't know using the Monero wallet RPC to, to just play around and get familiar with the, uh, the stuff. So, yeah. Awesome, man. Great, great advice to anybody young. That's the thing that, uh, it's, you know, wondering what they can do. How old are you? You're, you're, I'm 27 right now. 27 years old. Amazing. And I, I love the fact that you're, you know, you're trying to take it in the, in the correct direction, which is to, uh, keep things as decentralized as possible. I mean, atomic swaps is is just an ama amazing breakthrough. And like you said, we're, we haven't even begun to reap the rewards because it's just not super user-friendly yet. But it does seem like we'll, we'll get there. It does seem like we'll yes, definitely Yes, we get will there. get there. And there is, a, even in, or especially in the Monero community, I think there is a lot of hidden brain power. People are not so vocal as with Bitcoin. People are not uh, you know, in the clubhouse rooms talking about price. They are sitting in their rooms, reading uh, Zero to Monero or Mastering Monero, learning how to code and actually building cool stuff. And I think, or I'm hopeful that we will see you know, people who, who have been lurking for years, coming out with stuff and saying, hey guys, okay, this is my moment to shine. I have something to contribute to the community and um, yeah, improving the ecosystem this way. Yeah, good point. I think with Monero in particular, yeah, it's, you just see the tip of the iceberg with people on social media, like people like me, you know, on YouTube. Like we're 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 not we're not even we're not Monero. I mean, there's Monero are the people that are, that obviously the, the the developers that are building the protocol itself, but a lot of other people that, due to the nature of Monero, they they want to keep their identities anonymous and they're they're interested in the tech and they're working on it and yeah they're not on twitter talking about shit they you know they their identities aren't out there and they just got their heads down and they're and they're building um and yeah people forget that in monero uh and uh yeah i think it just, i think for the most part you really only see the tip of the iceberg with it uh, speaking yep. of which, uh, you know, one of the things we we were looking to do was throw a um, conference. We didn't want to call it a conference, kind of a, an event <laughs> in in Miami, Monerotopia. Once again, representing, I think, really kind of uh, the superficial side of Monero, right? Uh, but obviously, getting some some interesting speakers out there, some of the people that are actually building the stuff. And I don't know if you saw, but the whole thing kind of like blew up um because of unfortunate circumstances we're we're still charging ahead thinking about what we can turn it into so it more closely resembles our original vision did you follow that at all have you did you see the catastrophe with monerotopia yes you know i'm very closely involved in the monero community so when th something like this happens i usually see some screenshots but until a couple of hours ago, I have not read the um, Reddit posts, but I have now. And 
So I think all things considered, you handled it very uh, well. I think um, both sides have some valid points. I, in the end, I'm not really clear who is the organizer of the organization because ethically speaking, I think whoever is the organizer, the owner has the right to invite whoever they want and people who don't agree with that have the right to boycott and even explicitly boycott and uh, tell other people to boycott as well. But um, yeah, and I even re-listened to the interview with Chris Guy and yeah, he did not say the uh, controversial things to me, at, yeah. at least in, in your episode that you did with him. So I'm also a great fan of building alliances. You know, we don't have to agree on 100%, but if we can agree at least on one thing, hey, we can build an alliance on that one thing and band together, try to achieve something this way. So um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think I think you hit it on the head. I mean, uh, you know, he he's somebody that's he's not a crypto guy, right? He's a, he's a liberty freedom guy, and he has a hundred thousand followers. And my thinking was, you know, maybe they don't know about Monero yet, and uh, he should be somebody that should be interested in it theoretically. And when he came on the show, he did show interest in it and an understanding, and he got excited about it. I thought that was cool. Um, and that's why I wanted him to come talk, right? So to to talk about those, talk about it from the standpoint of somebody that could actually benefit from using it, whether or not you agree with the guy's views. And I'm sure, you know, there's many, many people that don't, and we're not really entirely sure what his views are, because I think there's a lot of accusations out there. But um, I got put in, in, a, in between a rock and a hard place because of the pressure that was put on me from the community and those that were concerned to the point where other people involved in the conference didn't want to be a part of it. And that's when it became mm. a real problem. So it's like the scenario, and this is a very extreme example. Imagine you're throwing a bit Bitcoin conference and somehow you landed Satoshi Nakamoto and he was going to speak at your conference. But then you, you Craig Wright? <laughs> Not Craig Wright. Let's say the real one, if there was such thing, right? Um, and, uh, you also had, uh, this, this sea level speaker who wasn't nearly as important, obviously than Satoshi. And he was wrapped up in this, whatever s scandal it may be, but people thought he, you know, didn't deserve a platform to the point where Satoshi said, you know what, I don't want to participate in the event anymore. What, what would you do? Uh, you're probably going to get rid of that other guy to make sure your, your conference sticks together st or goes off, right? Because uh, you don't want to lose the Satoshi. And this is just a hypothetical, but that was kind of essentially uh, the, you know, a very extreme example of the situation I was put in. So that's why I made the decision I made. Um, so yeah, that, that's my opinion. But what we're, what we're trying to do is maybe revamp and I'm just telling you now, we have, we'll see when we, when we put this video out, uh, revamp the conference, kind of scratch the whole thing, because I don't like the taint that it has on it now. I don't think it represents me as a person in terms of being so free speech and, and pro-liberty and anti-censorship. Uh, so revamp it for those purposes. And so, so it aligns better with what I think are the ideals of Monero itself, right? So at the end of the day, it is a private conference. It's not, you know, so that people can curate things. And that's normally what happens in conferences. So I'm going to try to do it in a way where essentially it's going to self-curate or can't be curated. So, um, and I'm just throwing, we'll, we'll see if I actually do this. Well, I'll know in a day or so, uh, but allow the anybody who wants to speak to essentially anonymously reserve a speaker slot <laughs> and, uh, you know, with an email and they'll have to reserve it with say one or two Monero, put down a down payment saying they're going to, okay. I'm thinking maybe give them the option to reveal their identity if they want, you know, mm -hmm. but they don't, you know, the default would be that they don't have to. Um, and they reserve a speaker spot. Obviously, anybody can buy a ticket anonymously. We already have that set up. That's kind of the current way. We just take their email. And then everybody shows up and we see who, who the speakers are. Uh, uh, the fact that they had to put down two Monero to talk for a half hour, an hour, means that we know they're at least into Monero, right? Um, and uh, 
it, it creates a situation where I'm then not held responsible for curating the event and being responsible for who the speakers are and what they're saying and see what happens. What do you think? You think that's uh, something that can work? I, I think that's a great idea and I'm surprised by your creativity. I, I wouldn't have come up with that. So I think it's good incentive wise you're holding people at least uh, somewhat accountable with the down payment um, but i also think if you're the organizer and it is your property that you're using to host the event you are in full control of the um the conference and yes i i think what but you I, did I on reddit want, I want to be in control you know that's the point so i don't want to fingers to get pointed at me uh, because maybe somebody does go and speak and they say things controversial and yeah, am I all for letting, you know, you can close your ears if you don't want to hear what people say, but unfortunately in the world we live in, uh, I'll be associated with whatever that those people said. And I'd still be associated in this new format, but less so, right? Because now it's like, well, you know, I didn't even know who was going to show up. Yeah, you did it in a non-custodian way. So. Right, right, right. The censorship resistant conference is... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think this is also somewhat sad. You know, if um, you cannot even hear the other side speak, and from what I've heard, even the worst accusations against Chris Guy are only speech. Well, come on, guys. It's just speech. You know, the guy didn't murder anybody or rape anybody, and... So to me, you know, as a um, anarcho-capitalist, I look at the violation of property and sure, you may disagree with the, the guy's opinion, but, you know, I'm an anarchist. I, I dis disagree with so many people in my life about fundamental things. And I'm not saying, oh, I'm never talking to you again, or if you associate with them, I will never talk to you again. So right. I think we have to put it in perspective and, you know, speech doesn't hurt anybody. And it, there is no such thing as hate speech. And uh, I'm absolutely for free speech. So, yeah. But I understand that the current context of the world is uh, different. So and people I understand have, your decision. Yeah, totally, totally. And people have to realize the, you know, the hypocrisy of being concerned about things like that versus being okay with a technology like Monero, right? Because... It is the most ultimate form of free speech. We know that uh, people are going to be using it in ways that you may not agree with, 100% guaranteed, already happening. Um, you know, maybe you don't like what certain groups are going to be doing with it. Uh, maybe you don't like the fact that it's being used on the dark market or it's being used to buy drugs or it's being used for ransoms. But that's the nature of the technology. It's digital cash. It's free speech on steroids for the purposes of transacting value. And, you know, these same people that are okay with building that technology uh, should realize that at the end of the day, they're building a, you know, a free speech tool the way i look at it yeah i i would agree with that so all right man great great talk uh we usually keep it to an hour or we're well over that and uh i, I appreciate you coming on i think your, your english is fantastic you should consider you. <laughs> an english version of the of the podcast as well um maybe uh any thought in coming down to miami were you were you considering it or you don't uh wasn't even a necessarily I yeah. I don't think I'm going to the US anytime soon. So, no. Okay. And uh, Monero Khan maybe might be in Germany, right? If something is in Germany, I will 100% be there and most likely be somehow involved in the organization because I know how, or at least I have some grasp on how time intensive and how much effort it takes to build a conference where people are coming and you have locations that you have to organize, you have to accommodate the speakers and everybody. So reading through your Reddit post, I, I really felt the, um, yeah, the blood, sweat and tears you're putting into Monero. And I just want to say thank you from all of the Monero community. You know, there's a lot of people lurking who are listening to your podcast who absolutely love the things you do. And um, 
this is just because there is a few vocal voices that are in the opposite direction. Um, you know, it doesn't do justice to all the the good that you uh, do. And so, yeah, I I personally do not fault you for inviting um, Chris Guy because, you know, just as you said, the benefit of the doubt. And even if he is an anti-Semite, uh, or even if he would be an anti-Semite allegedly, then you know, still we could agree on using digital cash. I don't, I don't see the the reason why I should be um, aligned with statists. You know, people who believe in the state, and and that's okay. But oh no, somebody said something uh, the wrong way. You know, statists actually support wars and support inflation, uh, theft. And, and stuff like this. So, yeah. You sound like a, a great potential speaker for Monerotopia Uncensored. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> we can get you over somehow to, to Miami. But I greatly appreciate that because... I'm an emotional guy. I mean, we're all we're we're all humans at the end of the day. We did I did we have and, and Sunita put so much effort into all of this stuff. And it did break our heart in many ways. And it was just unfortunate. But we're I think gonna pick up and keep and keep forging on, especially because we kind of came up with this new creative thing. And I, I I'm just motivated by what what it would be like if we actually pull that off. So that that's what's motivating me now, but I'm not gonna lie. Uh, motivation was lost for a day or two, a few days. And we were really considering, you know, the, the, you know, just stop participating route, you know, obviously never, never leaving Monero itself. I've, I've, I love Monero and I believe it's going to succeed, but maybe just backing off on, uh, being so vocal in the community, but, uh, for now, we're, we're going to continue to to forge ahead, and I, I do appreciate you uh, giving the support, man. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for all, all the right. good work you do. All right, brother, you too. Yeah, I wish I could. I wish I could uh, understand and listen to your po podcast in Germany. I'm sure it's amazing. Uh, where so? Where can people find you? Where can people learn more about you? Where can they find you? So uh, the Monero Mumble podcast you can find under moneromumble.de. And my website is alexanarko.live. It's in German, so I don't think um, the English audience will take much use from it. But it also has my donation address. And I have set up an open alias with alexanarko.live. And I have set up an, uh, I don't think it's called open alias, but the alexanarko.crypto is also um, the unstoppable domain thing where you can. Right. Send me a tip. And tipxmr.live is the website where we currently have the blog for Monero, uh, for the tipxmr. But I think something with the web server is broken because it only goes to the website when you enter www in the beginning. So, yeah, might need to reconfigure that. But that's me. Awesome, man. And maybe uh, when you get guys get further along in the project or, you know, you're ready to, to fully launch, come back on. Yeah, will do. And we'll test it live. <laughs> yeah, it would be amazing. All right, brother. Have a good one. Cool. Peace out. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.